there is a hunger to take that bait hope you should have watched or seen people how they do fishing whenever they do the fishing they throw a small bait in the line and throw that into the water and the fish is attracted to that bait and once the fish gets hold of the bait the fish is entangled to the hook over there it's the same thing we are tempted by the direct object that is thrown at us god is not even remotely part of the temptation you have to be very clear in this god is not remotely even possibly involved in our temptation a wonderful and gracious god lord we thank you for this wonderful time you have given us as the week comes to an end lord thank you for your presence your guiding us guarding us thank you for this wonderful time and thank you for the messages that you are making us to prepare meditate upon help these words to sink deep into our hearts lord open up our hearts and minds so your words can go deeper into and we will be yielding 30 60 and 100 fold lord amen whatever we do let your name be glorified lord you mend us you mold us you chisel us for the transformation but help us to yield to it lord let us not hold anything to us strip us of anything so we will be bare help us to be with us yield to your words surrender to you lord you be with us you speak lord we hear in jesus precious name amen 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 last time we started with the book of james it was more a wonderful time we spent last time learning on the insights of the book of james we started with who the author of the book was and then we looked into to whom it was written and we found that this was returned to the diaspora the word for the jewish christians who were dispersed during that time and we also looked at the big picture what the whole book is saying we saw that it is to be mature maturity is the main big picture of this book to be mature we saw two incidents that has to be happening one was salvation another one was sanctification salvation is a one time event the moment we accept jesus christ as our savior is our salvation and then the next event is sanctification which we looked into is an ongoing process and then we looked into various sections which are found in this book of which we started with real faith produce genuine stability that's the thing we started last time with looking into james first chapter from verses 1 to 12 before we go into the study for today i will try to recapitulate what we did study last time so that it will be easy to blend into whatever we want to do for today so when the big picture as i told you is to be mature and the very first chapter what we saw is under the section real faith produce genuine stability and then we talked about the themes especially for this section 
it is joy in trials, facing temptation, responding to the word. So first one to 12 verses last time we saw was joy in trials. And today we will be looking into facing temptations. And the key terms involved in this chapter are trials, perseverance, and religion. Last time we saw trials. Today we will be looking into perseverance and religion. So what James tells to the readers is when faith is stretched, it doesn't break, but perseveres. So we have to have in mind perseverance. <clears throat> when we looked into chapter 1 to 12 last time, what James emphasizes is when we face trials and tribulations in life, it doesn't destroy faith, but it actually deepens our faith. It produces endurance. That's what we saw last time. James is telling that trials are inevitable. And if you do remember, last time, through the verses, we saw four commands in the verses. I will let it, let it go again this time, so we will be able to remember them. The four commands, what we saw last time, are consider... In verse 2, no. In verse 3, let. In verse 4, ask. In verse 5, consider. In verse 2, what does that mean? Evaluate. Evaluate things when there is trial in the light of what God is doing to us. And the second one command is no. In verse 3, what he mentions is understanding the mind. When there is trials, we have to have that perseverance and the patience to build the character. So that's what he commands us, no. If you look into the verses, you will be able to know. I'm not going to go into depth because last time we saw that, I'm trying to recapitulate it. Then again, the third command he says is let. In verse 4, what we see is surrendering our will. That's yielding. And then the fourth command, what we saw was ask, which we find in verse 5. Ask what? Wisdom. And from verse 6 to 8, whatever we did lack the wisdom, James is telling we need to ask God without doubt. When we need to ask without doubt, what do we need to have? We need to have faith. And again, this kind of faith, what James is mentioning, is not saving faith, but sustaining faith. And from verse 9 to 12, what we saw is the trials that affects all people. When he says like tri trials are inevitable, it comes to rich and to poor. What James mentions here is, when the poor are suffering trials, they have the pride in Christ. That's the position we see in verse 12. But when the rich have the trials and tribulations, they are humbled. That's the, that's the message what we saw last time. Today we will be looking from verses 13, James chapter 1, 13 to 18. This section deals with how to handle temptations. Most Christian believers are super saturated with their education, with their biblical knowledge, but morally there is a failure in them. Most of the people are driven into temptations. These temptations, they do not have any limits. And the temptations, they don't respect any title. Or these temptations, they don't have any favorites. And it ignores all human obstacles carrying nothing. 
in the sense temptation can come to any human whatever his educational background is whether he is rich or poor whether he is a person in the pulpit talking preaching to people or a person who's sitting and listening to it that's the point he says and temptation it has many phases it can be a stealing or lying gossiping cheating envying or people who strive for popularity they are also tempted and people who are trying to take in power so i think like if i can say like there is this list is going to be an endless list of temptations just now as i told you like the previous sections what james dealt is the kind of trial in life that test a person's endurance here in this section from 13 to 18 James is exploring the test of moral endurance. In the previous section it was testing a person's endurance to keep the faith under extreme pressure. That's what we saw last time. This time it is the test of moral endurance. So I'll I'll read the verses and from 13 to 18 and I'm reading from the NIV when tempted no one should say god is tempting me for god cannot be tempted by evil nor does he tempt anyone but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed then after desire has conceived it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown gives birth to death don't be deceived my dear brothers and sisters every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows he chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created if you look into the verses again in these six verses james presents a truth about temptation in a very straightforward manner if you look into the verses carefully you will be able to understand the the message what he's trying to give us from verse 13 to 16 james describes the temptations the facts he gives us the facts and then 17 to 18 he gives us the information about how to be victorious in dealing with the temptation <clears throat> we will see that by going through each verses there are four things we need to understand about temptation according to what james is telling the first thing what he says is temptation is always present listen carefully temptation is always present nobody is exempt from temptation as i told you earlier if you look into the verses in first verse 13th verse he starts with when tempted no one should say god is tempting me you look into the verse when when you look into that verse when he did not use if there is a big difference between when and if James is writing when because he knows that it is going to happen it is in definitive time when it is happening it is going to happen that's the reason he to, he writes this when 
he did not write it as if because if if is used there is no assumption it might happen or it may not happen hope you understand this terminology when and if so he is using the terminology when he uses when tempted no one should say god is tempting like test of faith last time when we saw temptations as i told you are inevitable and there is no spiritual vaccine for that and there is no alternative route to avoid this this temptation can come to me who is now trying to teach these words this temptation can come to anyone who is listening who will be listening and it can come to anybody that's the reason i told you like temptation is inevitable and no one is immune to it one of the authors says this temptation can come to a common man who is living in this world fallen world and the same temptation can come to a monk who is sitting in a monastery with all the doors closed inside the monastery he is also fighting the same temptation as we are also fighting the temptation the second thing the most important thing james emphasizes is god never prompts temptation i will read the verse again when tempted no one should say god is tempting me for god cannot be tempted by he will not be tempted any one the reason why i'm repeating is we have in the past have said this in our language we say kadol ye enna undu ipdi sodikkiraru nu theriyala nobody can deny this people have done this people have attempted this i have attempted this i have heard even pastors using the same terminology god is tempting me we have to have in mind listen carefully god never prompts temptation god is never the author of temptation or evil never will he be because we know that god is absolute in goodness and holiness that's the, that's the message like james is emphasizing here to be holy means to be separate from evil to separate set apart untainted and untainable so god is holy a holy person cannot be tempted or he will not be tempting other people for evil things when i talk about holiness there are two sides of the holiness one is the inability to be affected by the evil and the inability to cause evil both of the things will not happen with god the god who is the absolute standard of holiness he is the truth what james is mentioning is god is not able to be tempted nor he nor does he tempt he is holy so you have to have it in mind god never prompts temptation if, if you are if you are using this terminology please take it into consideration that god never prompts temptation but you might ask a question how we will look into it if you look into the next verse verse 14 you see how he starts the word sentence but but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed uh, i would appreciate if anyone can read this verse in the tamil bible please verse 14 james 1 யாக்கோபு ஒன்று பதினான்கு அவன் அவன் தன் தன் சுய இச்சையினாலே இழுக்கப்பட்டு சிக்குண்டு சோதிக்கப்படுகிறான் the previous section what i told us god never 
prompts temptation. And when you look into this 14th verse, starting, how does he start? But, but is a contrary word. In contrast to what? In contrast to the wrong view that God is the author of temptation. In the same verse, James reveals the source. What is the source? It is our own evil desire. Evil desire. James is telling that the temptation originates in some kind of an external object of either a lust or a desire. See how he writes this as enticed by own lust. This, this terminology um, is, is more like a fishing terminology. It is baited. There is a bait that is dropped into our lives, which is an external object. That bait that is thrown into us is not a sin. You have to be very careful on it. Anything that bad is trying to attract us, that is not sin. Our problem is something deep within us, there is a hunger to take that bait. Hope you should have watched or seen people, how they do fishing. Whenever they do the fishing, they throw a small bait in the line and throw that into the water and the fish is attracted to that bait and once the fish gets hold of the bait, the fish is entangled to the hook over there. It's the same thing. We are tempted by the direct object that is thrown at us. God is not even remotely part of the temptation. You have to be very clear on this. God is not remotely even possibly involved in our temptation. We can't even blame the bait. That is one important thing also. We cannot blame the bait because like we live in a foreign, a fallen world wherein there are a lot of evil things that are happening around us. The temptation itself is a necessary cause. You have to have that also in mind. The temptation itself is a necessary cause, but not a sufficient cause. The point here is we alone are responsible for the temptation. What James is trying to say here is the bait plus our desire. See, he's describing the ingredients that are necessary for temptation a luring bait plus our inward desire. That's what he writes in this verse. Each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. So when these two are combined, the bait and our desire that will yield to the temptation will result in a disaster. That's what he writes in the next verse. Then... See how he starts it. In the previous word, it is a contradiction. But now he is following it up. In verse 15, he writes it as then. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Uh, can you, can you, anyone read uh, verse 15 of James 1? பின்பு இச்சையானது கற்பம் தரித்து பாவத்தை பிறப்பிக்கும் பாவம் பூரணமாகும் போது மரணத்தை பிறப்பிக்கும் பின்பு And he uses a contradictory word, but he gives us the source. Why are we tempted? It is because of our own evil desires. So once when the evil desire is bringing out within us, 
is taking the bait, that's the temptation. So we have yielded to the temptation. So once when we are yielded to the temptation, what happens then? After desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and the sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So it's a cycle of motion. That's what he mentions here, a cycle of motion. If we allow it to run, it will result in sinful acts. A very good example, everybody knows. To correlate this is King David. We see that we saw that when we studied Second Samuel, when the whole army was fighting, David was lounging around in the palace. He was fighting the spiritual war, but what happened? He lost the war against temptation. You know the whole story behind that. Walking on the palace of David was not a sinful act. But the inner desire within him to stand and stare at her was yielded to temptation. You have to be very, very careful. Like it's a cyclic event, step-by-step -step process. If you think about it, how we fall into temptation, this is a very good illustration. The moment he stopped and stared at Bathsheba, his internal desires got conceived to the powerful temptation he couldn't resist it. Right? He's, he plunged to temptation. What he did? He inquired about her. He sent for her. He slept with her. He committed as adultery. The sin, whatever he did, it did not stop there. See how he was trying to cover up that. And in trying to cover up the mistakes, what he did resulted in two deaths. Death of Uriah and death of his son. From lust to death. This is, this is a slippery slope of sin, what James is trying to emphasize here. You have to be very, very careful. The reason why I'm emphasizing here is the most frightening thing. David, a man, of, man after God's own heart, if such a great person of God can fall suddenly and severely, we shouldn't think for a moment that can that can't happen to us. You have to be very, very careful in that. That's the bad news of temptation. That's the message here. But the good news is any temptation can be resisted. A person can resist the desire to turn away the baits and retrace the path to his original position. When I when I mention this, I'm I'm reminded of a word from Martin Luther. Um, he it's a very famous quote by Martin Luther. He said. You cannot avoid a bird flying above your head. But you have to avoid the bird that is trying to build a nest on your head. Right? Your temptations, they are all around. I'm sorry, your bait. Your bait is all around you. You walk from your home to your workplace, go to the church, go for your shopping, even into your house. If you just come into your house, you have your television, you switch it on, there is a bait there, you always try to sit and watch it, you avoid reading the Bible, 
you avoid trying to have a fellowship with god there is no family prayer there is no unity there is no intimacy with god people try to sit along in front of the tv for hours and hours or we take our mobile and try to look into the mobile and there are plenty of things to so we have to be very very careful that's what like i think like martin luther was saying like you cannot avoid the birds that are flying above you but you can avoid them building a nest on your head <clears throat> going back to these verses again what james is mentioning here is the sin that is a very dangerous thing that's a monstrous offspring that's what like he gives us a cycle death cycle is what he is mentioning here if you look into the verses again see how he is given as if like it is giving birth to a child the sin that is being conceived it gives birth to sin right your temptation it gets conceived and it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown it gives birth to death again here when we look into these verses death most of the authors most of the theologians what they mention here is the death that is mentioned here is not the physical death or the eternal death that is eternal separation from god what these authors say is in the jewish background they always consider death as a different kind of a trajectory if you look into um, deuteronomy 30 15 chapter 30 15 it is written see i set before you today life and prosperity death and destruction so it is a choice between existence of life and death existence so there is a difference between life existence and death existence if you look into proverbs 12:28 there is another verse which says the way of the godly leads to life that path does not lead to death and again in proverbs 13:14 it mentions the instruction of the wise is like a life giving fountain those who accept it avoid the snares of the death so what james is trying to emphasize here is jewish christians they see people either traveling in a path of life that is walking with christ led by his spirit or these people are walking in the opposite direction that is a life that is being led without christ without his spirit that is the main goal or the theme what james is trying to emphasize here like either you walk with god with his spirit leading to life or you walk in the opposite direction walking away from christ without his spirit which is mentioned here as that that's that's the point he is trying to mention here <clears throat> so what we saw here is in verse 13 temptation is always present and it is never prompted by god and then in 14 and 15 what we now saw is like <clears throat> the consistent process of temptation what it follows and the fourth fact here james is giving us regarding temptation is temptation flourishes on inconsistent thinking temptation flourishes on inconsistent thinking how do i know you we will we'll read in two words 16 what he says is don't be deceived my brothers and sisters see here james he breaks into this description of temptation sin and its consequences with a clear command here he has already mentioned about 
temptation, sin, and consequences. What we saw just now. And now he just moves into the other section. He says, don't be deceived. That is, do not be led astray. When we have this temptation, as I told you, like these temptations come in, in many forms at different times, but don't let your thoughts stray away from the truth. Because in the process of temptation, everything happens in our mind. We force ourselves to think about something else apart from truth which will lead to lustful and evil thinking, which will finally lead us to sin and to death. So what James is mentioning here is, don't be deceived, do not be led astray, and don't buy any of the wrong thinking. That is the main emphasis here. And if you look into the next verse here, verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. See, after mentioning about the temptations, James is giving us these two verses, 17 and 18, how to overcome these temptations. <clears throat> God provides the victory over our temptations and sin. See, every give, good gift is from above. We know our Heavenly Father is always full of light and glory. He dispels the darkness of deception. When there is God, when there is truth, there is no darkness. There is always light. And he is an unchanging God in whom there is no variation or shifting shadows. When tempted, no one should be saying, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil. And the reality role of God is living a perfect, good believer's life. So what, what James is mentioning here is we have the presence of God who has given a new birth through his word. That's what he mentions in the next verse, the final verse. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So we have to be very careful when there is a bait that is trying to tempt us. We should be careful enough not to take the bait and we have to be very careful enough not to say God is tempting us. When we take the bait, it is our own evil desire. And again, we should not lead our thinking into something else by giving unwanted facts to take the bait and fall into sin. And again, God, who is always with light, who is the truth, will always help us not to yield into temptation. The lesson what we learn from this is which path are we taking? Either towards maturity or towards sin. The path that is taking towards maturity is how to endure through the trials which we looked in first verse to 12 that will give us an abundant life. When we say abundant life, that will not lead us into any temptation, that we have to have it in mind. Towards maturity, enduring trials, 
and that will lead us to a path of abundant life not death the exact opposite of that is leading a life towards sin leading ourselves to temptation and to the slippery slope of death so we have to examine ourselves on which path are we going there is a famous um writing by an unknown author which i want to give it to you it says so a thought you reap an act so an act you reap a habit so a habit you reap a character so a character you reap destiny we do not know who this person is who wrote this but these words are so touching that reflects the words of james the insignificant thoughts the minor transgressions and the harmless habits these all snowball into our lifestyle and will destroy the testimony of this person which can be you or me or anybody after going through all these six verses we have this question in our mind how can we avoid the slippery slope of sin and stand victorious against the lurement of temptation there are two important points with which we'll finish the first is victory comes through dwelling on the good victory comes through dwelling on the good see james is mentioning that the perfect gift comes from god verse 17 right we just now saw that surely god he gives us good things for good reasons we cannot have evil in our minds and reap good results nor can we have good things and try to produce evil so the big emphasis here is we need to dwell on good in order to reap good if you remember the verse i think like every one of us know this verse in philippians 4:8 finally brothers and sisters whatever is true whatever is noble whatever is right whatever is pure whatever is lovely whatever is admirable if anything is excellent or praiseworthy think about such things so victory comes through dwelling on good things we have to examine ourselves are we honestly doing this when we are under pressure undergoing trials undergoing temptations how do we react what do we think how is our thought process what do we read at that time do we really read something if so what is that we read what do we listen to what do we dwell on this are we reading the bible are we reading his verses is our thought process towards god or away from god during trials and temptations are we doing something true noble excellent praiseworthy or when trials come are we slowly poisoning our minds into something else driving away from god <clears throat> 
think deeply about the trials and the temptations and how we react to this. Are we drawing ourselves closer to God or are we trying to go away from God? The second lesson is victory comes through living the truth. The first one, what we saw is victory comes through dwelling on the good. The second one is victory comes through living the truth. James is saying that we have been brought forth by the word of the truth. That's the last verse. James 1.18. When the inevitable and the appealing temptations come, God can literally deliver us from the evil. But we have to yield to that. Are we yielding to God? Are we surrendering ourselves to God? I'm reminded of this words from David in Psalm 119. It says, I have hidden your words in my heart that I might not sin against you, Lord. The question is, how are we treasuring God's word in our heart? Are we reading his verses just for the sake of reading? Or are we truly meditating upon that and yielding ourselves and surrendering ourselves to his words, to him? We need to read the words, memorize them, meditate upon him, meditate upon those words so that our character, our conduct, our conversation will be more like him, more transformed. That's that's the big picture what we see in this book, James. Mm-hmm. Maturity, transformation, sanctification, that change that happens from inside to outside. This is an ongoing process. Meditate upon his words. Wait calmly for him. Listen to his whispers. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See, Lord, if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. Lord, thank you for these wonderful words, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Help us always to meditate upon your words. You speak through your words, Lord. Your words are active and alive. We always seek your words. Help us always to surrender ourselves. Yield us not into temptation, Lord, but deliver us from evil. Lord, we live in this fallen world. We try to bring us ourselves and our family, our children. Let none of us fall into any kind of temptation. But Lord, Let your words bring fruitful things. None of your words will return empty, Lord. You're an unchanging, ever-present, holy God who is guiding us. Lead us in the right path. We will not fall into temptation. Even though we sit in the darkness, Lord, your words are our light. We will not stumble on anything, Lord. Help us to uplift us in every walk of life. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.